Hello. This video will be a brief introduction to the phase behavior of hydrocarbon oil and gas mixtures. Now you're going to do this by illustrating some phase diagrams that you typically encounter for oil and gas fields and talking about different types of hydrocarbon accumulation, how I define what an oil field is, how I distinguish it, say, from a gas field. And so what I'll do is I'll um, use the whiteboard as before. that okay so what i'm going to start with is by drawing a phase diagram i will draw two axes here okay. this is pressure this is temperature so we have two axes here <laughs> this is the pressure of the reservoir this will be the temperature of the reservoir. And many of you may be familiar with what a phase diagram for a mixture of chemical components looks like. And so I'm going to draw it here, and then I'm going to explain all the different features. Okay. So what you have is you have a finite region of temperature and pressure where two phases are present in equilibrium. And those two phases are going to be oil and gas. Okay. Liquid oil phase. Then at very high pressures and low temperatures, things tend to be liquid-like. So here we're going to have a single phase, phase um, here that's going to be oil. Okay. Out. Okay. And then at very high temperatures and low pressures, things tend to be gas-like. And so this will be gas here. Okay. So this is uh, an example of, of what um, a phase diagram for an oil and gas mixture might look like. Okay, so let's now imagine that we have an oil field, and this is why I'm uh, using my green pen here. So imagine that we discover Field. This is my initial conditions. Okay, so what's shown here, the green spot, are the initial conditions. So here is here's my reservoir. It's initially at a high pressure and at uh, a higher temperature than we'd see um, normally at the surface. So in order to make that clear, okay, I can also indicate uh, surface conditions. So I can uh, find a different color for this. This will be the conditions at the surface. So this is the surface. Okay, so the surface is lower pressure and lower temperature. And in fact, generally, as we're going to explain, it's in the two phase region. Okay, so now what happens when we produce our oil field? If we're producing under primary production, so we're simply extracting the oil, not injecting anything, then what's gonna happen is the pressure is going to decline. So we're going to follow in the reservoir this trajectory, right? We're going to go down. And uh, may not be 100% clear as I've drawn that, but the temperature in the reservoir will stay constant. There's an enormous heat capacity in the rock. I'm not injecting or doing anything, so that temperature will stay the same. So that's actually supposed to be depicted by a vertical line here. Now, what you're gonna find is, what happens when we go from a single phase, so we have oil existing in the reservoir, in the pore space of the rock. When we cross this line, this line is called the bubble point line. Okay. Like that point. Okay. And this pressure here is called the bubble point. Okay. So the pressure is a pressure at which you enter the two phase region. And that pressure represents the pressure at which in the reservoir you start getting bubbles of oil evolving in the pore space. And that's a problem when it comes to oil production because you start producing this gas. Once those bubbles of gas connect in the pore space of the rock, gas has a much lower viscosity than oil, so it flows more readily and it's preferentially produced. So you have a reservoir that was initially full of oil you drop the pressure. Now, oil isn't a terribly compressible fluid, so there's a small amount of expansion. 
okay? Then this gas comes out of solution, the gas is preferentially produced, and you have a field that's essentially just producing gas, and you've left behind the more valuable component, your liquid oil. Okay, so in terms of oil production, this is a bad thing to do. I mean, if you're going to pick, pick up anything uh, from these lectures in how to operate an oil field, uh, rule number one is actually try and maintain the pressure above the bubble point, so you have a single phase oil that's flowing into your well. Okay, so that, um, defines an oil field. Now what happens when you bring it to the surface? Well, what happens here in a trajectory, which I'm not really showing because it's not of interest in this class, is you will go from the conditions in the reservoir to the conditions in the surface. And that will you do as the fluids flow up through the well. Okay. And clearly, as you can see, you're now in the two phase region. So when you're at the surface, you will be producing both oil and gas. And you do that even if underground you've only got one phase, one, gate, uh, one uh, liquid phase um, underground. So the surface conditions you produce both oil and gas. That's not a particular problem. You have to separate out the oil or gas and then um, the oil you sell and gas obviously you can sell or re-inject into, into uh, the oil field. In the wellbore itself, the idea that you've got these two phases is actually good for production because the gas has low uh, density the bubbles of gas actually move upwards and they entrain the oil. So in fact, uh, they help lift the oil from the deep reservoir to the surface. Okay, so that's an oil field. Now, you, know, you might say, okay, well, that's, that's fine, but what's uh, this strange black spot I've uh, drawn on the diagram? Well, those of you who are familiar with um, with phase diagrams, we'll know what that indicates. What that indicates is what's called the critical point. And let me explain. So when we hit the bubble point here, okay, we see um, bubbles of another phase. And we call them the gas phase because it's less dense. You can actually, um, you can take fluid samples from deep underground, okay? You have your fluid contained at the initial conditions in the reservoir, which you have measured, so you impose those in the laboratory, and then you drop the pressure, and you see uh, bubbles of gas, and you know that they're less dense because those bubbles rise up through the oil. But what you notice is if you were to look at this at higher and higher temperatures, the gas that comes out tends to have a more and more similar properties to the oil. The composition and the density become more oil-like. The oil, because you're increasing the temperature, is becoming less dense, right? It's beginning to expand. And the first droplets of gas that come out tend to be more and more, um, one might say, oil-like. And at the critical point is actually technically when you switch now from producing droplets of, or bubbles of gas to droplets of oil. So exactly at the critical point, when you produce the two phases, they are identical. Now you might say, well, that doesn't make any sense. How can there be different phases? It's only a point. As you move away from this, you see distinct phases. So on this side of the line, you have what's called the dew point. And the dew point is where when I drop the pressure, you have one phase, then you see droplets of another phase, and that other phase, is more dense, and you can see it, it will sink in your, um, in your uh, PVT cell, pressure, volume, temperature cell, so that's what you're measuring. So it will tend to sink. And uh, when it sinks, then you know that that's the oil phase. So this is the dew point, and you're basically producing a field that is now more gas-like, okay? So let me explain that in a bit, uh, bit more detail. So first of all, the word dew. Um, the pronunciation in English English is a bit strange because it begins with a D, but we actually pronounce it like uh, the first letter's a, a J. Uh, in American English, it's a little bit more uh, straightforward, dew with a D. Um, what is dew? Dew is um, if uh, you have a cold night and uh, the air is quite humid, which I can tell you is, is the case um, most of the time in, in England. Then in the morning, what you notice is the water vapor has condensed. And where does it condense? It condenses on things that are cold, it condenses on the grass. Okay, you also tend to get condensation on windows, for instance, but certainly the condensation on the grass is called dew. Okay? So that's where the word comes from. What it's used here is to, to refer to the condensation of liquid, in this case, oil. It has nothing to do with water. Um, and it's also a little bit counterintuitive 
because here we're having the condensation of a liquid as I'm dropping pressure. It seems sort of the wrong way round. Um, we're much more used to um, considering the condensation of a liquid as we reduce temperature, which would actually be moving in this direction, phase nine. So now um, let's describe the types of field that we can now um, obtain if we are at a higher temperature on this diagram. So actually I'm gonna start with uh, the easier case, right? which is here, what happens if I'm right out here? If I'm right out here, imagine my initial conditions are this red spot. Okay. Here, I avoid the two-phase region altogether. So as I drop the pressure, okay, the fluid simply expands and expands and expands. So if I'm to the right of this two-phase diagram, I have a gas field. And the way in which I operate that gas field, because I don't hit a phase boundary, I don't get some problems because two phases, and I'll talk a little bit later about the problems with uh, two phases um, when we hit the dew point, but let's, let's keep with this simple case first. Um, that's the way of operating a gas field. So if I have a gas field, which is defined now, not as, oh, it's a gas or it's got this sort of composition or some sort of, you know, vague rule. But what it means in terms of the phase diagram is, that I have a hydrocarbon composition in the subsurface. And as I drop the pressure at constant temperature, I don't hit a phase boundary, so it stays gas. And so the way in which I produce this field is I just drop the pressure. So a gas field, I drill wells, I drop the pressure, end of story. And because we start with a pressure that's typical, typically hundreds of atmospheres, um, we can't all the way go down to one atmosphere because then there's no driving force for flow, but we can normally go down to a few tens of atmospheres. We can have a 90, 95% drop in pressure um, because roughly speaking, and we'll do this more precisely in a moment, um, the, the, the amount of gas, the mass of gas, the moles of gas is proportional to, uh, for a given volume is proportional to pressure. We can have a 90, 95% recovery. Okay, so that, that's, that's pretty good. Now what happens at the surface? If we notice at the surface, we're here, we're, we're colder. So at the surface, you do produce some liquid. Now that's interesting. So you bring this mixture to the surface, the surface conditions are the surface conditions, and you produce some liquid. Okay. And that's good, that oil you can sell. So that's, that's, that's good news, um, it's not a problem. That liquid will evolve in the well bore. And so if we have that such situation, this is called what's called a wet gas. Now, again, just be careful with the language here. It's called a wet gas because the gas, when it's brought to the surface, produces liquid oil. It's got nothing, and I emphasize nothing to do with water. You can produce water from a gas field because there's water originally present in the subsurface. Okay? You can produce water, but that doesn't make it a wet gas. And again, it's a linguistic subtlety. In English English, wet normally really does imply the presence of water. In American English, actually wet is used a little bit more um, loosely to imply the presence of the liquid of interest. So in this case, because we're interested in oil, a wet gas has the liquid of interest, oil. And I'll give you another analogy. Um, you know, you're, you're in the United States and people might talk about, oh, this is a wet bar. And you might say, well, a wet bar? What do you mean? Someone spilt some water and needs to clean it up? No, it means the presence of the liquid of interest, which is being in a bar, is um, alcohol. Okay, so a wet bar means somewhere that will serve alcohol. A dry bar will not serve alcohol, okay? Um, so just, and uh, I'll, uh, I'm going to, going to give you an, an, another one of those uh, expressions in, in just a moment about gas. Okay, so that, that's wet gas. But we could have another um, scenario, which I'll do with another color. Imagine actually that the surface conditions are here. Right? Now this is, will be unusual if it's an oil field because it means the surface is warmer than the subsurface. So this is only really gonna be pertinent for gas field. You can have conditions where the gas field is here, you bring it to the surface and you're still in the single phase region. Okay. So that means you just produce gas at the surface and using the um, 
analogy I've used, uh, I've said for American English, clearly that it means you do not produce the liquid of interest. And so we call uh, that a dry. Now we've got uh, one last um, case, which um, I can do in, I don't know, so let's see if pink works, okay. Um, this is, it's called a gas condensate. So imagine my initial conditions are here where the pink spot is. Okay, now this is a gas field and the reason why it's a gas field, you might say, well, how do I actually know it's a gas field, is that as I drop the pressure, you hit the dew point. Okay, so that this point, you start producing another phase, you get droplets, a small amount of another phase, and you know that's a more dense phase than the surrounding phase, those droplets would sink, and so um, you're producing a, a liquid. So the surrounding fluid is gas by definition. Okay, so that's a gas condensate and it's called a gas condensate because in the reservoir as the pressure drops you produce oil condensate oil condenses out okay again i emphasize this happens in the reservoir you don't say it's a gas condensate simply because at the surface i produce some um liquid no i mean you can you can do this in a gas field right a gas condensate is where you produce oil in the reservoir as you drop. Okay, now, what's the problem there? It's more or less exactly the same as you have with an oil field, which is actually you don't want to cross this dew point. And let me explain why. So, what happens is you start producing gas. It's a gas field, normally that gas will flow quite readily, and so you have a large pressure drop. So, at the well, the pressure is quite low. Then, what happens is you drop below the dew point near the well where you're producing it. So what happens is the liquid drops out of solution and is in the pore space of the rock. So there are two bad things that that represents. The first one is the most valuable part of your hydrocarbons is the liquid, right? Because it's a light oil, it's a very valuable oil. And instead of it being produced at the surface, getting it out at the surface, what you're doing is you're leaving it behind in the reservoir. So that's, that's bad news. The second bit of bad news is that oil doesn't flow as well as the gas. So you're producing still just, uh, just the, the gas phase, um, but it's clogging the pore space, right? The oil is in the pore space of the rock. It's clogging, it's restricting the flow of the gas. And that's also bad news. So what you tend to find is you're leaving behind the most valuable stuff, just as you would in an oil field, right? You start producing the gas rather than liquid, you want to produce the liquid preferentially. And secondly, you actually find your gas flow rates are being reduced. So what do you do um, in a gas condensate field? You might say, well, the obvious thing is a bit like an oil field where you try and maintain the pressure, you inject something, you inject water to maintain the pressure. Um, in principle, that's okay. Um, in practice, it rarely makes economic sense because normally the gas is not as valuable to you as the oil. So in principle, you could do this, but in practice, uh, it's rarely done. So you want to avoid the dew point. How can you do it? Well, there are basically two ways of doing it. I'm going to show you how you do it. Okay. You either try and keep the pressure up here, and the way in which you keep the pressure high is, funnily enough, by reducing the flow rate. So if you've got your well, and you're trying to produce very rapidly, you've got a very low pressure here. So what you do is you actually restrict the pressure. You try and keep the pressure at the producing well um, above the dew point. Okay, so you sort of kick back a bit on production. You then vaporize all the oil and actually you find then your production rate goes back up again. That will work for a bit, but it doesn't work forever. So plan B is, funny enough, you want to avoid this region. But if you were to go down to this pressure, you'd still be single phase, you'd be all gas. So plan B is suddenly you with you drop the pressure an enormous amount. Right? You try pumping more and more rapidly, you reduce the pressure um, at the well bore so that near the well bore you're in the single phase region. Now, as you can see in this diagram, that requires a huge pressure drop, um, and, and then there's not much pressure drop to drive the fluid to the surface. Okay, so this may not be uh, that valuable, but if you were say at this point in the phase diagram, 
right, where you're just in the two-phase region, um, this may be uh, something that you would consider. And then people often say, uh, okay, but how do I know what it is? Well, remember this phase diagram, how do you produce this phase diagram? It doesn't appear by magic. I've done a schematic here. Um, you take fluid samples from the reservoir on discovery and you measure this phase diagram in the laboratory. I mean, I've just shown you that you'd have a little cell and vary temperature and pressure and you'd see where you had two phases and where it's a single phase. So this diagram is something that is measured. You know this diagram okay, before you uh, start developing the field. You need to know this diagram before you start developing the field. Okay, so that really um, is the first simple description of the phase behavior. And they're essentially um, these different types. You can be an oil field, and an oil field is defined by having a liquid oil present, and when I drop the pressure, you form gas. You have a bubble point. You can have a gas condensate, which is a gas field, and when you drop the pressure, you have a dew point and you produce oil in the reservoir. You can have a gas field, and there are two types of gas field. You can have a dry gas field, or you can have a wet gas field. I've explained what you mean by wet and dry. The, um, the last description of gas you sometimes might hear, and in fact, you might um, hear this about oil, is uh, sweet and sour. Now, <clears throat> again, it's a, a, a subtlety, um, a linguistic subtlety here in English. Again, in English, English, sweet normally means the presence of sugar, okay? Um, and sour means a sort of bittery taste. Again, in American English, of course, it can mean the same, but again, sweet and sour, funnily enough, mean the presence and absence of something desirable or undesirable. So when people talk about a sweet crude oil or a sweet gas, Clearly, they're not referring to the fact that there is uh, sugar present in the hydrocarbons. What they're referring to is there's something desirable about uh, that hydrocarbon as opposed to a sour crude or a sour gas. Okay? And what is the undesirable um, thing that is in the uh, oil or gas is H2S, hydrogen sulfide. And H2S is highly toxic. You can't sell gas containing this, uh, any H2S. So that H2S has to be separated out from the gas stream. And it's exactly the same as what you have to do with CO2. If there's CO2 present, you have to separate that from the gas stream. So what you normally do is uh, you, know, you can use amines and essentially dissolve away um, the more acidic components um, and they're retained. And then you can heat up these amines and the gas is released. And you might say, well, what do you, what, what, what do you do? What, what do you do with this gas that you separate out? That comes at a cost. That's why it's not so desirable because you have to separate it out. Um, interesting thing here is the separation of gases, H2S, CO2, has been around in the oil industry since the 1930s. This is not some new wacky technology. Um, if it's just CO2 at present, what people do is just vent it to the atmosphere. But H2S in many places, I mean, H2S is highly toxic. So just venting it to the atmosphere, particularly in a populated location, isn't uh, terribly desirable. So what you do is you compress the gases and you re-inject them down in the subsurface. So in fact, it turns out there are hundreds of places in the world where H2S and or CO2 are separated out um, from a gas stream, um, compressed and then re-injected underground. And you haven't heard about it because it's normal oil field operations and the oil industry gets on with it and uh, you know no one has to uh, make a big uh, fuss or parade about it. Now it's a big issue because of carbon capture and storage because what we need to do is actually capture a lot of CO2 and inject it underground. Um, and so people say about carbon capture and storage, oh, it's this new wacky technology and we don't know if it's ever gonna work. Well, I'm sorry guys, but the oil industry has been doing it for decades. Right. And it's been doing it for decades, um, sort of, I would say, under the radar, because it hasn't been done for uh, climate change reasons. Okay, so that's my um, first phase diagram, and that, 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 that looks fine. 
One thing that may be a little bit misleading about it, it sort of gives the impression that you have different types of field, an oil field, gas condensate, gas field, for a given hydrocarbon mixture, and it's just dependent essentially on the initial reservoir temperature. Now, that is true, right? You can have a hydrocarbon mixture that at a higher temperature would move from being an oil field to a gas condensate, but that's not the major difference we see. The major difference we see is we have some fields that are essentially all methane, so they're dry gases. Right? Um, it's gas at the subsurface and it's gas when it's uh, brought, brought to the surface. Um, and you have some hydrocarbon accumulations that are essentially tar-like, they're virtually solid at room temperature, and so they're heavy oils and they contain uh, long hydrocarbon chains. And so principally when we're looking at different types of field, this diagram isn't really the diagram we want to do. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to draw one other diagram um, that actually shows the different, different types. Okay, so uh, that will be here. I'm going to clear this diagram and then I'm going to draw another one. So it's going to be the same. It's going to be by pressure temperature. And what I'm going to do here, right, is I'm going to have a spot here, which is my initial temperature and pressure. Right? That's my initial conditions. And I'm going to put my surface conditions here. Pressure at the surface, temperature at the surface. And I'm going to keep those fixed. Okay, so imagine I keep those fixed. All right? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw different phase diagrams for different types of hydrocarbon accumulation. Right? So let's do uh, the first, which is, you know, this will be an oil field, okay? Okay, so this is my oil field. Right? And you can see here, you go down, that's the bubble point line, the critical point is to the right, okay? The, uh, the uh, surface conditions are in the two phase zone. Okay, so now let's, um, now let's do some uh, different examples, okay? So let's start with um, a dry gas. So if we have something that's almost entirely purely methane, okay, it won't be 100% methane, otherwise uh, you wouldn't have a two-phase region. Um, but imagine you have a gas that's mostly methane, may contain some CO2, may contain some H2S, because one of the things I didn't say before, is this sweet and sour, that's a word you might hear, um, there will be a phase diagram, but it doesn't have some special phase diagram. Okay? It's not, it's not, you can't look at the phase diagram and say whether or not it's uh, sweet or sour. So this is dry gas. As you can see, um, you do not, the um, surface conditions, the initial conditions are way out here, the surface conditions are here. Basically everything is to the, basically to the right of the diagram. So that's, uh, that's that. Let's um, do a wet gas, okay? So what you tend to find is your phase diagram as your composition gets heavier, that is, you get longer and longer chain alkanes in your hydrocarbon. Your phase diagram sort of starts at the top right and then moves down, right? It moves down and to the, and, and, and to the right. And let's explain why. Right, so a dry gas is mainly methane, right? Virtually all temperatures and pressures we're interested in, we've just got a gas. If you have an oil field, here we're going to have hydrocarbons from methane all the way to C10, C20. Things that are much more liquid-like. As a consequence, you're going to get a much larger oil region, okay? So large, um, low temperatures and pressures you're going to get, you're going to have oil present, and you need a very high temperature, essentially, to vaporize all of that hydrocarbon. Hydrocarbon, so um, you only get the sort of gas region um, at very high temperatures. Okay, so that 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 should ho hopefully explain the sort of shape of this diagram. So we've got dry gas, um, wet gas. We've got an oil field. Um, let's do the gas condensate. Okay, um, I can't remember which uh, which colours we were using. So um, these are. So we're going to get something like that. And this is now where the, the initial conditions will hit the phase diagram, but the critical point is to the left. 
So this is a gas condensate. Okay, now I'm gonna do one other extreme. which we hadn't discussed before, it's a simple case. Um, so here's a case of a heavy oil. This will be something where there is in fact no gaseous components presence in the oil, it's sort of tar-like. You, you often see this with, with shallow fields where there hasn't been much of a conversion of the kerogen, okay? And so the initial conditions, I mean, in theory, there might be um, a two-phase region, but actually when you bring it to the surface, you notice um, it stays in the oil zone. So this will, the heavy oil is something where you don't produce any gas at the surface. So that is fundamentally, you know, the, the other possibility. Okay, so that, that is your sort of, um, your phase diagrams as a schematic. I, as you can see, I've just done this schematically. There are other diagrams in the notes and you can look at more professional books. Um, the classic textbook in this area is called McCain, right, which looks at the thermodynamics of hydrocarbon mixtures. Okay. I'm just going to show one other case because that's of, of, um, of interest it's in green. Okay, imagine we have a, a field whose phase diagram is sort of like this and where the critical point is very close to the initial conditions. Okay. Right. And we could even have another condition which is so sort of like this, right? and I'll explain these in a little bit. So let's imagine that we have the critical point that's really quite close to the initial conditions, okay? So in this case, this is still an oil field, as you can see, it's to the right, but the critical point is quite close. And that's called a volatile oil. And the reason for that is it's normally an oil field which actually contains quite a lot of lighter hydrocarbons, C1, C2, C3, C4, right? C5, C6. And so when you bring it to the surface, you're actually producing a lot of gas and it compared to the oil, okay? There's, there's quite a lot of gas produced. So it's quite volatile, which means, you know, it, it's easy to vaporize, okay? That would be your volatile oil. And then you can actually have a case where a near critical oil, where we're very close to the critical point. So it's not, terribly clear is this an oil field is it a gas field now technically you know which side is that critical point is it to the left or the right okay and we need to determine that um but it is actually near critical it behaves like a critical mixture it's not obviously an oil field it's not obviously a gas field it produces a lot of liquid and a lot of gas as well okay so that's um your uh, combination that you might Okay, so those are the phase diagrams. Okay, these are quite simple phase diagrams to um, describe oil and gas mixtures. And they tell you the different types of field and the different ways of describing them. I'll finish with um, one last thing, which is again, um, sometimes can uh, be a bit confusing. So. Sometimes you hear, and I've drawn it in black, um, people talk about a black oil uh, or black oil field. Um, that seems a bit strange because oil is a black color, crude oil in general is a black color. And uh, the reason for that is, is lots of branched alkanes that have sort of said that before. Okay, so that's what a black oil is. When you look at more uh, lighter mixtures, actually, um, that the, the hydrocarbon will come, uh, become colorless, right? Petrol, for instance, which is the lighter fractions is colorless um, or sort of uh, yellowy or orangey color. Okay, however, the description of something as a black oil is not, in fact, referring to its color. It's another thing where you think it's referring to its color, but actually it has a technical reason. And the technical reason is actually how we describe a, a, a oil and gas fields. So, in principle, a hydrocarbon accumulation is a mixture of hundreds of different chemicals. And how we might describe them thermodynamically with a, an equation of state, if we want to put an equation to this phase behavior, is by understanding um, the behavior of these hundreds of molecules and their interaction between them. 
But what we normally do is we simplify the description. And, then, and sometimes just saying it is a bit confusing because you haven't really thought about it. But how are we going to describe it from now on, right, when we're going to put some equations down, is we're going to assume that, in fact, your hydrocarbon mixture has two, basically just two components, sorry, an oil and a gas. Um, let's get rid of that. Okay. So you have an oil and a gas. Okay. And the gas can dissolve in the oil. Okay. So we can have the gas dissolves in the oil. So we have different amounts of gas that can be in the oil. So what we do is we describe our hydrocarbon mixture as a liquid phase, that's oil, and that oil will have properties that will be a function of temperature. And then as a function of temperature and pressure, there will be a gas, and the gas is assumed to have constant composition, and a certain amount of gas can dissolve in the oil. And that model is called a black oil model. It essentially says there are two components. There's an oil, a liquid, that is what you have at the surface, a gas, which is what you also have at the surface, and what you have in the subsurface is just different amounts of gas. So you might say, well, yeah, what's wrong with that? Well, how could it be different? Well, the reason why it'd be different, clearly if we're near the critical point here, so if we're looking at a gas condensate and near critical oil or a volatile oil, that doesn't work because we know near the critical point the gas and oil are very similar compositions. So actually gas has a composition very similar to the oil. When I bring it to the surface a long way from the critical point, the gas actually has a different composition. It tends to be actually lighter, right? uh, more gas-like, right? So when we talk about a gas black oil field, which is the thermodynamic description that we apply to the vast majority of hydrocarbons, um, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're simplifying the thermodynamic description. And that's, that's what it means. So in fact, black oil is a technical description, not um, a description of the color. Okay, so I think um, I've said enough for this video. I will be continuing a description of phase behavior um, uh, later in a subsequent video, but I, I think for now, this is simply introducing those phase diagrams. So I will, I will finish here. Thank you. Thank you.